even though martial arts really crafted me and gave him, gave me all his power. Like this stuff was like wizardry. This was not like meeting strength for strength or speed for speed or being faster, stronger. This was like literally superpower Jedi stuff, which was just insane to me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Grappling Podcast, where we talk about grappling. And more specifically, we actually look to understand individuals' journeys through grappling and martial arts and understand what works. I am one of your hosts. My name is Matthew Bartman, and I'm here with the other host of the Grappling Podcast, Levi Van Stappen. And today, for our first episode, we're actually going to do an interview, and I'm going to be interviewing Levi about his journey through grappling and martial arts. So, Levi, are you ready? I believe so. A little time travel. I'm good with that. Okay. So we'll start. We're going to start more in the beginning. We'll kind of go chronologically through it. Sure. So what age were you when you started your martial arts journey? I was, let's see what's here. So it was, it was literally my very first day of high school. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Literally the first day, like after I got to with high school, I went and took my first class. So that was 2003. So I was 14 years old. Okay. Nice. 14. So what did you, which martial art did you start with? So started with American freestyle karate. I was at a video rental store by Piggly Wiggly. And when we were checking out, they had like one of those boxes that said like, you could win a free class if you put your name in. And I was with my friend Ian and we're like, oh my gosh, like there's hardly any names in there. So we'll go put our name in and, you know, see what happens. And then my parents got a call like three days later about us coming in to take a class. So yeah, that was really fascinating. Um, mostly I think when I was looking at it, uh, I had already at the time been watching like obviously Dragon Ball Z. And oh, yeah. <laughs> I was really big into that. My friend Ian actually too was the one who introduced me. I'm like, I just love the idea that they were training and fighting and the animation looked so good. And just this whole you know, feeling of like, I get stronger by working harder on things. Like you're not just innately strong. And I think that really attracted me. This idea where here's this outlet to say, hey, if you want to get stronger, this is how you do it. Versus before, I didn't really feel at confident with it. So when I saw that, um, that box for a free trial, it was like a sign from the universe. And then on top of that, getting a call. So for me, it was like some sort of cosmic alignment do you think they I'm called like, everybody no so i found out five years later that they were they took a box from one of the schools because now i'm like more involved with the studio and then all of a sudden they're like all right they dumped out all they're writing everyone's names okay and i'm like what are you doing and then yeah. he's like well here's our list of people that we're gonna call i'm like you don't just pick one name and call <laughs> <laughs> like you ruined my whole like purpose of what <laughs> i was doing here i thought it was like cosmically chosen like the name picked out of the hat it's like we call everybody. I'm like, oh. that's actually okay though. Yeah, I yeah. loved it, but it was just like in my mind, I was like, I was chosen for this. Like yeah. it was my purpose. <laughs> and it was like, oh, call everybody. everybody. Yeah, everything. You know, it's funny though. Like that's actually, um, you know how there's that saying that like when the student is ready, essentially mm-hmm. the teacher will appear. That's really and the yeah. the reality is that you are obviously ready for the yeah. students, or else you would have just read it on. That's true. Yeah, and went and we'll got a seat bar. Yeah, right. So we'll ignored it. That uh. So th- there's something to be said that you were ready. And yeah. at that time, that was the perfect, funny enough, piece of marketing to help you engage in that. Well, what was cool was the studio, uh, Karate America, had just o- been open for a month at that oh, point. So pretty fresh. So it was like very fresh. Like they hardly had any students at that point. And okay. it was like probably uh, eight or nine students okay. at that point. So nice. I was kind of jumping in. <laughs> be a little bit one of the older kids. Um one of the other kids was also Dylan Kithrow. So yeah. crazy. It was the same timing. So tell me more about your experience when you started karate. Because you obviously did it for a while. Yeah, yeah. So I did it for, let's see what's here. I would say roughly eight years, eight years or so. Um, definitely enjoyed the process of learning all the techniques and the movements. Um, enjoyed the workout aspect of it. Uh Getting belted was cool. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember when I got my first belt with the yellow belt, um, we were at some big gymnasium and I was like taking it super serious. Oh, oh, yeah. I was like, this is my first belt. And we're there with like other schools too. And, and I just want process too. Yeah. Like yeah, I wanted yeah, to be like and serious and like focused and things like that. Um, 
So I took it pretty seriously, like more serious than maybe I should have. But I was just immersed at that point. And that's kind of the time where I discovered Bruce Lee. And then that kind of took off for me at that point. You know, it's funny to talk about like the seriousness thing. You know, people will bag on seriousness when yeah. you like care about something. But I think it's cool too, because you, you cared. And there's nothing wrong with caring, right? Yeah. And I like seriousness and care actually what's going to like push you forward. So even though it may have been like, you were like, this is spiritual. You yeah. Know? Like, and, and then in reality, looking back at it, you're like, no, no it this is a but it, when actually it was something that helped shape you to who you are today Yes, and taking it serious. That's okay. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Well, I think I just held it so tightly to me. Like this was something that was really helping me out and to be in a space where we were like, oh my gosh, I'm representing the school. I'm representing like, you know, as we're going to a, you know, big group promotion. Mm -hmm. um, and then plus I'm seeing like everybody else, like all these head black belts and stuff walking around. Like I wanted to be at some point, like seen close to them. So I think I was really trying to stand out as far as like, no, this is not something that I'm just kind of haphazardly doing this. Like I am dedicated to being amazing at this so it was i think to me getting the belt and getting that promotion was you know very important to me at that point so no, that's cool i like it i was in prestige so then you did uh you did american freestyle for a while mm -hmm. did, and then you ended up getting into jujitsu mm -hmm. so you told me about that story a little bit before mm -hmm. maybe uh share with the audience a little bit um you know, just i guess some of the highlights yeah you know, as far as so there was a big transition from karate to jiu-jitsu um the first thing that transformed for me in my martial arts journey was going from karate to basically uh bruce lee's training philosophies okay. because as i got more into martial arts i'm researching things and bruce lee was obviously someone who really stood out to me and this was someone that was evolving his martial arts training past just fighting and kicking or punching and kicking and going a lot more into like how we utilize in our day-to-day -day lives. And he was expanding upon it into more like uh, weightlifting and like the physical side of it, having like being more flexible and being strong and powerful. And like, that was where I started going like the YMCA, like yourself, like started to lift weights, starting to like more craft my body mm -hmm. instead of just going to the cry school five times a week, just punching and kicking. Like now it's like I was developing myself. You yeah. know, seeing like every workout routine and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then through Bruce Lee, he was very much like having to explore multiple styles. So learning boxing or learning, you know, judo or whatever. Um, but I always like the idea of being able to control a self-defense situation without actually having to hurt somebody. So I like the idea of judo a bit um, to bring someone down to the ground. I started getting into like Aikido. Because the whole thing with Aikido was like you were redirecting energy. Like the whole purpose behind it, right, was like redirecting. And so I got enamored by that and was kind of like, oh, that's great. Like if someone was aggressive at me, I didn't have to punch or kick them. I could just redirect their energy and then nothing would be for the better. And then I stumbled upon some old uh, uh, Kung Fu style that was like Shaolin Chin Na. <laughs> and Chin Na was uh, the main thing that Jet Lee was doing, oh, what movie was that? It was like the Chinese connection he was recreating. It was like he came back to the studio, he was doing like boxing and all this kind of stuff and everybody was freaking out. But he had a classroom scene where he was fighting students and he would like dislocate their joints. Oh. Like he dislocated the guy's jaw and like the arm and suddenly they couldn't use like their arm. And then when the fight was over, he went, like he popped it back in. And I thought, how cool that you could do some kind of crazy joint lock and like disable somebody and then you could just keep going like no one's hurt. So I basically yeah. took Aikido and this shell and Chinat and I merged it together and I'm like, this is cool. We could take someone down, not hurting them and affect their joints. I never knew what jujitsu was. And then suddenly I saw my story was the same as everybody's story watching uh, Hoist Gracie in the UFC doing his thing yeah. and I went holy crap like that's exactly what I want to do so I got their old instructionals like with Hoyt Gracie and Horian Gracie showing like Gracie self-defense 101 watch all the Gracie in action videos of 
there's self-defense. And then obviously I started using it in the karate studio and uh, they were just kind of, I shouldn't say floored by it, but they were just, it was very separate. Mm -hmm. It just like, we're doing karate and that's something completely yeah. separate. So it wasn't met with open arms at that point. Um, but I was still really into it. Um, I ended up having my very first, my very first jujitsu class was with Huron Gracie, which was insane of going out to Torrance, um, families, neighbors. We went and visited them, stopped at the Torrance Academy. I'm wearing my black belt and they're freaking out because I'm 16 years old walking in. Cause I'm like, I, I'll just change at the hotel and I'll just walk there and, and you know, whatever the case may be, the 16 year old kid would do. And, uh, Halleck Gracie was at the counter. He's like, no, you gotta wear a white belt. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's fine. And there was upstairs, they were teaching classes and things like that. And there's Henner there, like quick ran up to our family and said hi. And then I had a private lesson with Huron and it's like being able to be filmed as well. And it's the one piece of footage I'll never watch again because- You should watch it. It's, it's horrible. I, I know I have it somewhere. Um, but it's like one of those things where go, if we make a Patreon, maybe we should put that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so bad though, because as a kid, I was like, I got mounted by a Gracie and they were like, what would you do? And I was like, well, I would just shove you off. And then he'd held me down and my brain exploded for those, those two days of doing privates with him. You're, you're dislocating jaw locks. Yeah. Like or... nothing was working. <laughs> no, <laughs> but just, it was cool. Like be able to do chokes or arm locks and things like that. And it was just amazing because to me even though martial arts really crafted me and gave him gave me all his power like this stuff was like wizardry this was not like meeting strength for strength or speed for speed or being faster stronger this was like literally superpower jedi stuff which was just insane to me and the main way to get better at it was to get smarter at it to understand it more and i was like that's amazing. Like you're literally telling me I could take on more and more people and, and beat them better, control the situation by just reading books and watching tape. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, I guess in the early days old. too, where less and less people knew, like if you knew one thing, right? Like you yeah. have a trap and roll, like you're doing pretty. Well, having like a blue belt don't, don't skill. Like the mermaid escape out of it. Oh, a hundred percent. Like think early 2000s. If you were a blue belt, let's say in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you were a god amongst everybody. Like you held some crazy mystique of like, I know I do an arm lock from mount, or I know how to sweep from the guard position. It was like, or do a rear naked choke, or a rear naked choke, oh, like, wait. or a triangle uh, choke. Well, I went to my first seminar here in the area, and it was with Rodrigo Vaghi, and a friend of mine um, was going, and I went along. Cool. And it was like insane because the first. 10 minutes for warm ups, and I had these guys who were really into jiu jitsu putting triangle chokes on me. And I'm like, I felt like my head was going to explode. And I still have the notes from it. It was like, how to do a Mata Leon. And Mata Leon is, you know, Portuguese for, you know, the lion killer, which was the rear naked choke. And like having notes in my book of like, here's how you do the rear naked choke, hooks in and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, to me, it was just the coolest thing because like, I can go back to the gym and be like, no one will know what this is. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was really enlightening. I think that's where I kept going on with the chest thing. I left karate behind. I went, I just have to explore this and, and go with it. Okay. So you said you're about 16 around? Yeah. So 16 was when I had my first experience with it. And then, uh, yeah, I would say I ended up leaving karate once I got my third degree plaque belt. I went out probably about 20, okay. 21, something like that. And then I just kept going out my jiu-jitsu career at that point it's awesome and it's really uh did you end up watching the ultimate fighter and things like that oh i went to see the ultimate fighter like every kid did when you went to like blockbuster or family video and it was like in the like extreme section yeah. you know it's like the same with like was it faith is a death or whatever oh, there yeah, was like yeah. you know the intense ones where it's like here's like human fighting or whatever so i watched all the early ones and just yeah it was just insane because he was going against people of like different sizes and intensities and just like different would, tactics. So to clarify, I was meaning like the ultimate fighter show. Remember the season? Oh, the right. Yeah. When we were like 13, 14. Oh, right. Yeah. Not the championship. Like that. Yeah. That was with the uh, Forrest Griffin Stephen and Bonner. Stephen Bonner. Yeah. And then and you got guys like guys. Tito Ortiz and yep. Chuck Liddell and all that stuff. Yeah. So I started getting more into that 
there was a place in town actually in Appleton that was like had a MMA gear too that I had got. I still got the rush for it. Oh, like, I remember that place. I still in college. At college, yeah, yeah. right that corner. Yeah, yeah I remember it's like I remember going into that and be like, I never went. But it was like, but it was like kind of this like idea tap where it was like so cool. tap out. Yeah, yeah for a tap out gear. I had gotten a tap out shirt from like you're gonna laugh, but like Coles. And it was like in the kid section for whatever reason, <laughs> but it was like an extra large kid. Oh, but yeah. it had like diagrams of all the different, like, there were like, you know, sketches of all different like, arm locks and chokes oh, and all that actually, stuff. That's a cool shirt. And I thought that was really cool. And I was, oh, God, I'm not sure if it's this somewhere still, but um, yeah. So then I was, I was up on that hike too. So I'd be sitting there watching all those things. And again, during that time, it was still kind of very new. I mean, I remember watching UFC 60. And that was like Hoist Gracie and uh, uh, Matt Hughes. Matt Hughes. And that was that whole like, here's this fighter from the era. And yeah. it's like, one of the Matt, promos. One, Matt, once Matt like destroyed Hoist, it was like, we are in the new era of martial arts. It was like wrestling, destroying Jiu Jitsu, or the understanding that we need grappling sense in order to be a sufficient, you know, mixed martial artist. Like that was this new thing now. And then just went from there. So it was. Ben Hughes was a cool guy to watch. He was like a welterweight. Welterweight. I mean, very solid sense of how to move his body and super, uh, super like solid dude. Yeah. Like he seems like insane. And strong. then you get guys like George St. Pierre start popping mm-hmm. in, and it's just like the go. It was. At least I think the go. It was amazing. I mean, I liked it because on top of that, they were kind of uh, started making like old kung fu films where like there were storylines and they're like, or like say WWF type stuff where it's like. It wasn't just two skill sets. It was like someone's strengths and someone's weaknesses and like how they play off of each other. So it was narrative. Yeah. So it was, it was really enticing to be able to watch it, but I was getting so enamored just of the, you know, the style matchups that I love seeing. So jujitsu for me was that same sense of like, oh, this guy's really good jujitsu. And then once I see it go down the ground and they're getting choke or arm lock situation, I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh, there it is. There's jujitsu. Like you know, winning in these matches, you know? So it's interesting when you first started that some of the stuff that looks really complex. I remember mm-hmm. the first time I saw a, a triangle show. Yeah. I was like, what just happened there? You know? And I'm like, so just like, what? Like, I was like trying to figure it out. I can't and remember the lit. It can't... really was like, now it's like. Yeah, uh, it's so straightforward. One of the most straightforward <laughs> thing that you can do. Yeah. Well, or like watching combinations. Like someone escapes out of an arm lock and you switch to a triangle choke. Oh, yeah. And it's like, whoa, like, yeah. you're that. That's insane. Like, you s- set that up. And it was like, so like, I mean, I can't remember what that move George St. Pierre got caught in, but it was something like submission. It was like, but it was like a simple esque kind of like switch or something like that. But it completely took him by surprise. But it's like now 15, you know, 15 plus years later, like, it's not complete rocket science of what he did. Like, every Jiu Jitsu person. 20 days into their classes, like knows it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. well, look at how evolved. people start here and they get leg locks in their first week, you know, like it looks kind of funny. Yeah. Not, not to change topics too far on that, but like, you know, I think the, the sport is evolving and well, and people kind of are dramatic fashion. the baseline now for new people coming into martial arts has changed dramatically depending on where you go. There's some places that are still very like, there's like, you know, I, I don't know why I give this example, but there's like one blockbuster left in, Alaska kind of thing. Like there's, oh, there's some places yeah. where it's like yeah. you, you can have weird timeline shifts. Like you can probably see in Appleton or other places like yeah. old Kung Fu places that for some reason are still yeah. existing. Yeah, you see them your own like and, area. Yeah, stuff, but you know. people will walk in and go, hey, I want to do this. And they're still kind of stuck in that 1980s, 70s thing. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a basketball gym and they're, like all, they're all using old basketball stuff. Like it's not really a thing. I think it's just like how information travels across the country and yeah. how things get adopted. It starts in New York and California areas and then it kind of, and like big areas, right? That comes up four tolls in. Each thing blows up. Look yeah. how long it took for us to get a Lululemon. <laughs> you know? Like, okay, you know, right, that was a while. And this is actually a big mall here. This yeah. isn't like, we don't live in the boonies. Yeah. You know? This is like, we have a huge mall. Yeah. And we finally got a Lululemon. Oh, Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Yeah, we got a forever. Chick-fil-A like a year ago. <laughs> yeah. You know, we finally got a pop of chicken. With that? Which is funny because our we've had really good food in the apple. Yeah, area, but like, it's just so it makes sense. Like, yeah, like if you go to California, I bet you a lot of the, New York and California. I wouldn't be surprised. Could be wrong if a lot of the schools were like, nope, 
wrestling and leg locks are a standard part of our curriculum, just right. like everything else. Yeah, I would say the standard. any modern uh, modern com- competition schools, I would say, should be having them in their database. Like, okay, so let's move back to you. <laughs> okay, since we're talking, you kind of think down memory lane. Oh, so it's cool that you've done two martial arts mm-hmm. and then you were exploring some other ones, mm-hmm. found out some stuff that worked and I'm assuming some stuff not um, have worked. Definitely not, yeah. You know? Um because, yeah, like, Akido is a tricky one like that, right? Like, you see it and you go, like, well, look at yeah. go. And then, like, and then the minute you try that two-on-one wrist one, yeah. you realize, it, like... Wait a you, second. Yeah, it doesn't really work. You just sad. end up getting, like, body locked. Or, well, I like the idea of the lifestyle. Like, I got hooked so bad. So there was this documentary on... Oh, uh, hold on, wait, wait. Oh, go for it. I'm going to say the name and tell me if I'm right. Okay, because yeah. I have it in my notes right here that I'm going to ask you about this documentary. Oh, go for it. Okay. Where, by the way, you were, were you around like 13, 14 years old? Probably, yeah. Was it the XMA documentary with Matt Bullens and Chad? Oh, I've never Mike seen Chad. that one. Yeah. yeah the, where Mike Chad like, was, yeah, I remember seeing Mike Chad came here. And they did like the, like seeing how much force a person kicked with. Oh, dude, that they, was sweet. Yeah, it wasn't the, um, it was uh, the XMA is actually what it was. It was before was XMA was XMA. It was Extreme Martial Arts was oh, the name of the documentary. What was the one that was on uh, uh, Fight Science? No, mm, that was. I think a, this was all after that. Oh, was originally Mike Chat and Matt Mullins. Okay, and the Mike Chat, and uh, they were like kicking like sensors and stuff. Just yeah. how much force it. Well, there was it, there know? was one with uh, Randy Couture. Randy Couture Randy squeezing the shin out of something. Yeah, like that. Or I think was a Hickson one too. Hickson did that too. That. Yeah, that was like how powerful. Like there's a Taekwondo guy and yeah, like yeah. that. Yep, they had a dude who did like ninjutsu. Yeah, too. but it's cool because they're trying to kind of find the truths yeah you know of what was working and they did like the skeleton thing right where yeah they were, like show the bones working. oh yeah you know and crush in line well, but anyways was that the documentary or no it was close but it was oh, i was gonna it, break out yeah I, really, look at really yeah accent, i even really have yeah, not notes. the forms that's funny yeah <laughs> so it was um it was a documentary that it was almost like i should say the opposite feel but it was all about shaolin monks and part of it was like showing their day to day lives, like I almost have like memorized. Like the they would wake up at the crack of dawn and they would it sounds hilarious. They would literally like climb up a mountain, like hands and feet. I think I've I've seen this one. And then they'd go down and, and they like would squat, jump yep, up it and stuff, doing all this like craziness. But it was like the lifestyle. And they're sitting there in the big mess hall. And they're all eating rice and it's like back to forms. And they're like you know, punch in water or, you know, whatever. But it was like one of the cool orange robes. Yeah, yeah. But it was, it didn't have any of the feel of like today where it's more of a demonstrative thing. Oh. It was just a thought process. I mean, you, you watched like Last Samurai or whatever, but it was like a lifestyle. Yeah. They woke up and this is what they were dedicated to do. And I wrote so many notes for myself of like, you know, being 16, 17, like, all right, you're going to wake up. You're going to go do bricks up and down the hill. You're going to do push-ups you know like i grew up on a hill by the by the river but i was like but it was like this idea where it's like my life got turned into like wanting to be some sort of training beast like watching a kickboxer yep you know or blood sport or whatever okay i'm gonna ask you a a question but before i I'll just show okay kick my chocolate yeah i know i have a thing about (laughs) my name no, but he was, it was fantastic because here's this guy who doesn't really have too much experience and his brother gets destroyed. Yep. And he goes to this like old, Again, you know, trainer and just like, but what's funny about that movie is that it was not kickboxing. Oh yeah, they're doing like tie boxing. Yeah, like tie boxing yeah, or like Muay Thai or whatever. It was like, yeah. it was like more intense things. So the kickboxing aspect, I remember I, well, lit- I literally went like to like a bookstore or whatever and I got like the dummies guide to kickboxing. Nice. And I'm like reading, I'm like, this doesn't seem like the shit that you went through. But it was he dropping coconuts? Yes, coconuts. I'm yeah, like, this, this is it. what I need. But like even watching him with Bloodsport and Bloodsport was just like, again, like here's all these different styles. And, yeah, yeah. and it's like based on a true story, you know? And it was like Frank Dukes and it was like... Supposedly. But it was like this idea where it's like, here's this mystique training and, you know, the dim muck and things like that. And it was like, it had this all mystique to it. But I just love this like street fighter type mindset of like, I'm just dedicating my life and becoming like this amazing fighter and not like some big competition guy. But I just love this idea of like it's constantly funny. being stronger and training. Hyperbolic. Yeah. Like that's why I was just enamored by it. I don't know why. And when I think about it, like 
it wasn't me utilizing saying, I'm going to be like a state champion or I'm going to be like a mm-hmm. national champion. It was just like, I love this fact that I was getting stronger or doing things that yeah. I couldn't do before. There's something super cool about it. Yeah. I think ever a, a lot of guys like the training on the mountain idea. Yeah. Like, same boat. I was in the same boat. And like, I won't go too far because I know we're going to do the reverse of this other episode, yeah. but like, but, 100% on the same page. But now with jiu-jitsu, that's my drug on a weekly basis. You you can't, I, I, will, I will say this straight out, and this is 100% fact and no one can doubt me on this. Jiu-jitsu has that mystic feel if you're doing it right. Yeah. Not many martial arts have it where every single week or very frequently that you could come upon something and suddenly yeah. like switch the balances and destroy your partner you just learned a new spell at your for it's all board. spells you know, it's like, all spells yeah. oh, it's you, all it's always spell to your counter spell yeah like let's say the other day we're doing ham sandwiches we should start calling them spells it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got some good spells just, here. Got spells got some counter spells got some yeah. dark bars with yeah. the leg locks yeah, and i would right. say the dark bar and the twister would be a <laughs> dark <laughs> the dark bar. you have the three band moves yeah, that you can't do yeah. Yeah, apparently, the Texas clover leaf is one of them. Oh, that's blue bell. Blue bell, you still can't do it. It's so ridiculous. Dumb. So they have, but it's like this mystique that, like, I sit there and watch Dragon Ball Z, and I'd watch all these things where it's like they're doing these big energy moves and these big um, yeah. spell things, and it was kind of like a everyone had their own unique style and something that was very powerful and mystic, and that you could keep leveling up. That is something kind of neat about DBZ. And- yeah. Anime is a good job with is uh, like not everybody's doing the same thing because it'd be boring to watch. Yeah, but in reality, when you develop your heme, it's the same thing, well, right? When you think about like you Naruto, it's be... like different elements and different styles, and like I, I love it, but it's like what you naturally or self gravitating. Here's towards. a good example: when you watch things like My Hero Academia, like the quirks, the quirks, but the quirks level up. Yeah, you know. So, but you won't find many martial arts that you have this ability to level up. So for me. Like when I was very early on my career, I learned something like a triangle choke and I'd throw it on everyone who's trained karate. And they were like, what? like they have no clue what this is, but it's something amazing to think like I could still do that with fellow spell users of like <laughs> here. I, I'm freaking out about ham sandwiches. I'm dreaming about ham sandwiches yeah, of like, awesome. how could I create angles to now exploit this move? And it's like, it's something that I've been doing this for so long that I, it's constantly refreshing myself. If, you know, if I'm training, right, if you're exploring, right, of like, wow, like it literally does not stop. And so it was like, suddenly I found this endless supply of that drug for me. Yeah. That was like, I can just literally examine something a different way or someone can show it. And finally I could shift the tides immensely in a battle. So, so here, I have some questions for us too. Okay. What are some of your favorite martial arts movies mm. and why? That's a, that's a separate podcast. We got it. <laughs> okay. I got to go into it. Um, so give us a teaser. Then. Okay. Well then, uh, now there'll be full synopsis. Are you saying as far as like, just, uh, why don't you like to, as a kid, uh, that you thought were cool, even though like, if you watch them now, you might be like, that's terrible. Sure. Cause we're not going for, it doesn't yeah. have realism unless that's what you want. Uh, I was a big fan of answer. Jackie Chan movies. Oh yeah. So like, uh, Jackie Chan is the man. A legend of the drunken master. Yeah. So, so it was like technically the sequel to drunken master, mm-hmm. right? Like in the more of the oriental one, but yeah. uh, rumble and Brogs was, was really fun. Those are ones that were more exploiting how amazingly cool you could show martial arts. Yeah. That I thought was, was really fun. Um, so to, to, to pause on them for a second, Jackie yeah. Chan movies, like a lot of people sleep on how amazing some of those fight scenes were. And like, yeah, they're not like it doesn't look like an MMA fight because no. it's not. It definitely like it's a show. You're you're watching a yeah. movie, but like when you look at the raw athleticism, creativity in them, yeah, unparalleled. No, his team was second to none. It, they motivated every other martial arts movie that came after it. Um, I remember seeing clips of. There's a really good YouTube clip I'll have to send you that talked about kind of the beauty of Jackie Chan and and his creativity and things like edit or that Jackie was really big into editing. Mm. Of like how you edit shots. Okay. And it's like there's ones where it's like if I punch you in the stomach, it does have as much power instead of cutting here and then a new shot shows me hitting your stomach. Mm-hmm. Like it's like ba, like pa pa. And it's like so suddenly you punch it like a lot more power into the movement just by the way that he was editing his film. You feel but, the impact as the viewer. 
But... Yeah, but he was also completely crazy as far as he says, I will do as many takes until it does it right. Mm-hmm. Like he does weird things where he'll flip a fan and look perfect. But he literally did that a hundred times until he like, I want to look like this. And he will keep doing it until it hits it. And I'm not sure budget why thought they can keep doing it. Um, that was cool. Uh, other martial arts films. Uh, well, I'll do another one. Jet Li Unleashed. I thought it was really cool when no. he was like that dog. Yeah, and yeah, he yeah. like unleashed and he would just like, you know, be really direct. His was um, fun. Other Jet Li too was uh, The One. The one, yeah, and the one was good. The one was intense. I think the one was probably his time cop. Yeah, you know, like, time cop one. Or I, I'm saying like as far as like JCVD's time cop, it's yeah. probably JCVD's best movie. Oh, time as cop. As far as yeah. like narrative oh, and like crap. I think the whole package as far as yeah. the movie and if you look at it from the time frame and whatnot, I would say the one is probably because it does have that whole time element and mm-hmm. stuff. But as far as like creativity and whatnot, I thought it was awesome. The one, and then uh, I forgot about the one hero was more not so much martial arts but i think it's one of my favorite uh, it's very artsy artsy like mm-hmm. as far as like weaponry i thought that was was really fun um and that's why this he got his move too i this definitely shows the stand but i love the feel of street fighter 2 like the animated movie I'm oh, not yeah. sure if you ever saw it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Incredible. It's incredible. Just so you know, families, uh, there's a couple scenes. Ah, that yeah. yeah, that was, there was, I mean, it's Bo and I were watching it once and I was like, oh. Yeah, there's some mature, oh, yeah. mature look, but yeah. but that had a very, it had a very strong vibe. It didn't yeah. have like. um Huge impact to it. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. But I'm saying like it, when you had like the promo art for even just Street Fighter 2 itself, it was like, it fit it perfectly. Um, they actually yeah. has Street Fighter 2 animated series that i think would probably be more bow appropriate yeah it was like ryu and ken like wanting to travel and wanting to be the best kind of thing let's say that movie was really good like the the drawing in it is incredible yeah i like saw a scene from the one what anime is that that's incredible no i mean every scene there was there's not a point where it was ever super i mean the beginning where he's like fighting sagat and then like lightning out and it's like the music playing and just like, oh, it was so good. But that's the kind of stuff that really spurred me on motivation wise, like watching these things. And oh, it was just, yeah. and again, it, stories are a very interesting thing. Like it had nothing to do with um, uh, the realistic of it, but it was this mindset. It almost like being a kid years ago and reading a book about like nights or whatever. Like yeah. it was the same thing. It's like, it's more like messages to live by type thing. So when I'm watching these warriors and these people, you know, train and, and live this lifestyle of like, I want to become the best that I can be. It was motivating to me, especially when the life I was kind of surrounding myself with didn't have too many of those people. So I think I kind of got immersed myself in that own world. And even, even the martial arts school I was at, like, I'll say pretty confidently, I didn't meet too many people that I had one or two people that was kind of nerdy like that a little bit, like yeah. really getting into it. But most other people treated it as like almost like a YMCA course where it's just like, mm-hmm. I'm checking in, checking out. And yeah. it's like, there was no, there was none of that for me. It was like 24 seven for True. me. Hey, too bad we didn't go to the same. I know. I'll think of that. Like, like, we did think we went the like, same freaking training on the top. Yeah, we've been we've been so we great been in the forest at Haysaker Park. Haysaker Park. Yeah, I lived I live right next to Haysaker Park, so <laughs> it's like it was perfect. But it was. But that's what I'm saying. Like that was my mindset when it came to it, and so yeah, that became difficult because I really immersed myself into it and, and didn't find too many people that were kind of the same mindset. So that was weird. You're like the Nina at that point. So let's see. I was just looking at our time here. Sure. So we probably pretty, you know, we want to be wrapping this thing up, but I have a couple more questions for you. Sure. Okay. So first one's a little bit of a silly one, but did you ever try the shin conditioning with the ice (laughs) bottle? With the ice water towel? What? Ice water bottle. Okay. I'm looking at your response and I'm guessing no. No, I mean, you didn't. The shin, shin conditioning stuff. Like I met this one guy that was like, had these, razor blade shins i never knew what to think about that like for sturdy shins i'm not sure it was sturdy though i think what the science behind it was that it deadened your nerves on your shin Mm. so you could kick harder it wasn't the fact it wasn't the fact that like your shin i mean i'm sure the bones crack and healed over again like i mean you take any tie fire they could probably break my leg just kicking but 
I think a lot of it was like deadening the nerves mm. so that you didn't feel anything. So you just throw this thing at people. Yeah. So I think maybe a couple of times, I mean, I saw that scene with like, obviously kickboxer, where he's like you can... kicking it and it's like his shins like all broken open and things like that. But it's like, I tried it for five seconds. Yeah. That's all I, yeah. Yeah. I like, I like was like, oh, I'm freaking do this when I was like 14 or whatever. Yeah. And I started banging the, and on my shin, I touched it like a three times. So yeah. Like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> Dalton, done with that. Not you to get you in my like shins. Empty water no, I mean, most of my kicks were like everything was like, oh, yeah. upper ankle and stuff. So, like, I wasn't, I wasn't like shin, ch- it was more like shin checking, if you ever want, like, kick yeah. to, to bring the shin up. But I think guys just wreck other people's shins too, like MMA, just low kicks and low oh. kicks and low kicks. And it's like, dude, that's insane. But no, I have not really okay. dove into that too much. Oh, crap. I like it. I like it. Um, all right. So, I know we were t- actually funny enough talking about American freestyle quite a bit as we were going on memory lane there. Let's bring it back to jujitsu and grappling. Okay. So what is something that you would say you learned at each belt so far? Mm. Something that really stands out to you, like a one or two bullet points at each one. Starting with white. White for sure was me learning to slow down. Mm. Okay. Like going from white to blue. I think I was just, I did not have a speed of control. And I think that was just lack of knowledge, mm. but I just would go. It was just like five minutes of sprinting. Yeah. It was not like, uh, cool, let's figure stuff out and let's set traps or whatever. It was just like, you're just grappling. So I would be five, six minutes into grappling matches and be exhausted. We would do like only one or two of them. We do one and then we sit for five minutes and talk about it a little bit. And like, you want to go again? Mm. Like, okay, we'll see. And then maybe last four or five minutes, mm. you know, but. So pacing. Most of my stuff, especially from white to blue, was actually a lot more of the self-defense stuff than was the grappling. Gotcha. So it was a lot more tech. Because of the school you were? Yeah, okay. because it was more self-defense focused. So we didn't do too much sparring like here and there, but it was the same thing. Like we didn't really know the language. But in, in again, from white to blue was like just exhaustion. Um, blue to purple was uh, a lot of it was frustration of being able to pull off core techniques. So like being able to do a triangle choke or an arm lock. You're saying frustration and like you couldn't? I couldn't. Pull it off? Okay. Because the people I was training with who I, let's say I wanted to challenge myself like a blue or a purple belt, it was never going to happen. Mm. It's because they, they knew of a triangle choke or they knew of an arm lock. And these are people I trained with somewhat frequently. So it was rare. Because the ones who taught you. Yeah. And it's like, hard, yeah. it was like, we know all the same tricks. And then so I'd go down the same route going like, let me find something fancy. Let me find something that like they haven't seen before. Um, so there was a lot of like congestion with that. Or let's say I had to work a lot harder. Like if I had a triangle choke or whatever the case may be to like get something. Mm. It was like, now it wasn't an exhaustion of like, go, go, go. It was frustration of like how much work it took to end up getting a submission. Or it just became a scavenger the whole time for Blue Belt. It was like, I got lucky if I got something. Um, and then purple to brown belt was the era of specialty. The cross collar choke saved my jiu-jitsu career. It saved me. Yeah. A hundred percent. Because when I got to purple belt, I started feeling like a purple belt. Like I was going against blue belts and white belts and I felt fine. But I still always measured myself against either the same belt or people above. I never, I, I didn't see it as fun just... It was fun kind of showing my power, like I could tap someone and things like that, but then got boring. I'm like, it, it frustrated me. Those colors put... were kind of everywhere. So... Yeah, well, so what happened was I had a private with the guy who promoted me to Brown and said that, I'm like, I, I'm not tapping anyone. Like, this is kind of my, mm-hmm. my blue belt era. I'm like, I'm not tapping anyone. Like, everyone knows my game and things like that. And the main focus was to take one thing and dive super deep with it. And that became cross colors for me. Like suddenly I started focusing on entries, like literally step by step, every aspect of a cross collar versus like how to enter, how to control it, how to get the other hand inserted, how to control that, how to apply it. And I literally created something that was a Frankenstein monster of a hundred different black belts, like Hotcher and Pedro Sauer and John John Machado and all these guys. And when I rolled, all I was focused on was building the entries and building like, I could get that, I could get that. And I slowly progressed it to where 
no one could stop me from the train group I was with to, to get cross collars in. Like Luke can tell you all about that. Like I just was a monster with it. Um, I would teach classes about it and just like, I was so good, but that allowed me to free myself up stress wise with everything else. Then I just realized I have the formula now. I can get better at things if yeah. I just put a little more of a micro focus into I'm gonna it. I'm going to make a nerd parallel here. Sure. Um, so it's interesting because the whole focusing on a couple of things, it's, it's truly a great way to get better at jujitsu. Yeah. And I think it probably works for everybody. The only thing is it's hard to do because it takes discipline. Yep. And you have to also have like a base knowledge first before you know what to deep dive mm -hmm. into, right? You know, yeah. Like there's certain things that might be not as fruitful in your time. No. But if you think about it, you know, we're talking about like all the animes, some animes you liked you know, when you were training and stuff yeah. and got you into training. The idea of specialization, people sometimes I think kind of point their nose up at it, but the reality is you have to. If you, if you think about it, Piccolo doesn't do a Kamehameha. No, just he has special a special beam cannon. cannon yep. yet. Shikoku doesn't do a special beam cannon. Why? Yeah. Because he spent his time. Yeah. Kamehameha. And the reality is you got to like, you got to pick your specials. Yeah. Essentially. It's just like a video game. It's just like anime, anything like yeah. that. And the reason is because time is finite. If we live to be a thousand year old creatures, yeah, you could probably be great in everything. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality is in the time that you have to do jujitsu in your life. Yeah. It's probably a good idea to pick just a few things that are your core Kamehameha's. Yeah. The rest are. Well, I think, I think because in the, in, in the worlds of ranks of jujitsu, you're not really like a purple or brown belt. You are possibly the average of all the different skill sets. So the problem is that we've all met people who were like, wow, if you got stuck in his triangle choke, you're screwed. But the problem is that if you get really good at hunting those things, like the other day, we're talking about leg locks. Well, if I just spent white to black belt, only just doing leg locks, yeah. or I, I, let's say I don't do ranks, but I just say my way to of give, playing jujitsu grappling is just doing leg locks. To give our listeners a little context on that idea. That's right. <laughs> you know, we were talking about the idea of having like specialized, like masters of a specific discipline yeah. a school mm -hmm. and how would that help its students grow right and the thought experiment that i threw out was what if somebody who intentionally knowing they're going to get a lot of shit only trained leg locks from white to black belt yeah what would that look like what would be the benefit is there really any downside yeah and you kind of talked about that you'd be probably really good at winning mm -hmm. in a match but as far as like your expression of the art it'd be kind of might be it might be kind of uh, like dulled a little bit, yeah, you'd it, eventually want to learn some other stuff. And I guess that's up to that person too, if like they that's want true. to express yeah. it. Cause there's a lot of people who don't like doing wrestling and the takedown aspect, but yet they, it is a lot of work. They'll sit on the ground and they'll slap bump, but the other person will kneel and they'll slap bump. And it's like someone from the outside could go, why don't you train standing? That's part of jujitsu. That's yeah. part of grappling. And it's like, I guess, but and then it becomes that whole true Scotsman argument like what is yeah. what is like the true expression of what you do and you could say the same thing of going it's probably good well if you got really good at arm locks you should go train other things and it's like why maybe like you know it's art it's like I get to decide how I want to enjoy yeah. it I would only argue if someone was complaining mm -hmm. about something like you say this is the way and suddenly you're getting complained why the white bell is tapping you with something I'm like yeah. Yeah. You were focused on other things that you didn't want to, you know, explore it. So I think it's just a specialty to say if the example I always give for students is that having a specialization is like a buoy in the ocean of jujitsu. It allows you where you can go. I know I can confidently get to that point and hold on to it and I won't drown. So if you know you can always come back to that buoy, you'll be more exploratory with everything else. You'll, you'll go to things and fail. Because you know you can always come back to that if you need, or the the desert analogy I gave of like, you won't be so scrambling for water if you always know you have this one specific source for water. You can go out and say, I don't care because I know if I want to drink water, I can grab that. I'll jump back to the question about belts. All right. You talked about. Oh, from the. Okay. And then we had still uh, purple to brown, right? Yeah. So purple to brown was. Is that when you did the cross colors? Yeah, so oh, that was the okay. cross towers. Yeah, I okay, gotcha. So, but that broke it out for me where suddenly I just became this god of cross towers. Cross it's <laughs> like, but it made me like really calm down and go, I wasn't as thirsty anymore. Mm. And when you're not as thirsty, I knew I could always come back to that. So it allowed me to loosen up and see things and play with things. I wasn't so like dead set on needing to tap anybody anymore. 
So it allowed me to explore positions or get caught in things like it wasn't so much of a life or death thing anymore. Like I knew I could beat this person if I wanted to. So it allowed me to just like, especially like with get colors in the gi, it's like, Oh, they're everywhere. Right there. Right there. Bomb a guard and I can hit it. Top of mount. I can hit it. It's like, it was, I had so many different ways of faking people out to catch it. And it's like, it's sort of helped me break through to, um, Brown belt. Kind of cool. You have half the choke, even if you're just in a control position. Go, and no like, one cares about it. No yeah, one cares about just one hand. They think, oh, you're just holding on to my position, but it's I'm right there. And I take it every single time. And it's like, so I always feel like the middle finger, like a couple times where I'd be stubborn, where they start peeling out of it. Yeah. And then it's literally just as, you know, left of my finger holding your whole posterior chain. Oh, I know. You're not old. Um, but it allowed me to break through. And then, from that point, um, late locks became a really real thing for me. So that was once I once I just broke into brown. Suddenly, I was really exploring late locks, and then now it just feels like cheating in that sense too. So I guess most people, but yeah. I think people are getting more and more savvy to it, though. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like in the beginning, it was like a language, but it's not fun to hit it on people who don't know what's going on. It's true. It's so. kind of, I think it's a little bit fun. Sometimes. Just it's fun, bit. especially with an, a person who has an ego with things they are doing or, a good job. Or they have a really good thing, too. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like doing your things in yeah. each other. Yeah. It's like, I love uh, how you can catch light locks from such wacky spots. Too. It is weird. It's like, hey, mount me so I can light lock you. Yeah. You know? It doesn't <laughs> like, work for, for most people. It just kind of, you know, and the, the mount me so I can light lock you falls apart sometimes. <laughs> but like, but you know, the but specialty thing, thing, like if you're so good, like let's say you're so good at the kipping escape, yeah. like, I've been getting decent. I've been getting decent. It's been helpful. No, you you, know? you you advance it from kipping to like, I don't like know. Like a salmon. Yeah. I should, that's salmon and... Yeah. I'll there's, admit though, there's, there's, there's sometimes it's kind of rough. Like, yeah. You know, it, doesn't but, always, it doesn't always work. No, it just... It's, it's a second panther thing. You, sh you know, six to seven times. Yeah. It works every time. You and shake it off and it was amazing. So, yeah. So, those are the main things for me crossing over each belt that... Yeah. Uh, let's say so, it allowed me, here. allowed me to relax more. So, what's your... So, now you're, you're in the precipice of transitioning to another belt yeah right so what are some of the lessons you're taking with you now and you, you may change these some yeah time, i like, think i think for myself progressing towards black a lot of it is the experience that i've seen everything there's nothing that really surprises me anymore it's just the efficiency of how people do things yeah so it's like you're stuff. never gonna stop me at some point and i go what was that like mm -hmm. Unless it's like, like we talk about like the hand sandwich move before. Yeah, it's like, you did the, unique. the double camp sandwich. Yeah. It like weird. Some, some things are unique. Um, but in overall grappling match, I know people's general purposes. Like if they're underneath me, you know, there's gar X guards and like locks and things like that. They're on top of me. Like I know they're probably trying to progress to this point, this point. So for me at this point now, it's a lot more having very strong dilemma games and having a jiu-jitsu match where they're just in my world. Mm. It's it's nothing where I'm I'm ever reacting to them. Like a couple of things they throw me off, but how can I quickly sh ship this match to where you're reacting to me? Like it's more of a gladiatorial demonstration to me than it is a competitive match. Okay. This is you throwing yourself into as a to the gods of sacrifice to me. Like to to me, like that's my mentality of like if you're coming at me a competitive wise, I get down on myself if I'm being a lot more reactive or I didn't have answers. Yeah. So it's more yeah, like, why, why don't I have this answers or I have an answer, but it's not a quality answer. Gotcha. How come this was a quality answer before? And now you're giving me this argument. It's something like, like it's knocking on a door and nothing's happening. Like, so it sounds like it's the, like there's a shift throughout the uh, progress of your belts from where you were more quantity focused mm -hmm. and then around, around blue, uh, purple, brown, I mean, yeah. you started focusing on the quality of something. All quality, and yeah. now it's just, the further expression of that quality switch. I broke through that foundational phase where everyone looks at blue bowl purples and is like, you're supposed to triangle choke, you're supposed to arm lock, but why can't I do it? Mm, yeah. Like it's easy to do when people have no clue what's going on. But if you have just a little inkling of what a position is, it's like you have to dive so much deeper to get back to goal. Do you do you feel like that the those uh and like process of where you went through all the different belts, learning all these different things? kind of reset a little bit when you decided to go full nogi at the school yes uh position wise submission wise like a lot of it left me mm. 
Um, it's like, cause like I was thinking about triangles, for instance. Yeah. Way easier setup than the game. Nope. Way easier. I had to throw out more than half of my knowledge when it came to setups because suddenly it was not going to be applicable. Like you couldn't say step one, grab the sleeve. Yeah. Like the sleeve grips are it, right. It's not that. Hand. Yeah. But it suddenly left it me. Sweaty wrist. But you know what was great? I was like, so, so, so much of my martial arts journey, I'm so quick to throw shit out immediately to throw something out to the side to go, I can't, this is wasting my time right now. This is inefficient. Like this is, this is going to hinder me right yeah. now. So once they started getting to Nogi stuff, it was like, I can't, I have to like let that stuff go mentally and start reinforcing Nogi stuff or to like really start finding sources of people who are very reputable with Nogi techniques to see how much there was a crossover. Mm. And Allison's like, oh no, like hitting a triangle choke from guard suddenly was a lot more tactically different yeah. than from the gi where I'm like, oh, I can slice my knee over and take it or I posture control. It was like, like I knew the world, but now it was like, no, oh, like it didn't, now it didn't feel it tasty to me. Like it felt like I've been cheating this whole time. Uh, yeah. Like climbing it didn't feel the, authentic. The climbing the rope helps so much. Yeah. Like a triangle chokes is a good example too, because Triangle jokes and no gi, like they're kind of hard to get sometimes, like from, yeah. from guard. Yeah. Right. Like the weird thing is, I find that they're more of a like almost half scramble position that you get, you'll get into a one in, one out and scrambly yeah. stuff. And that's when you have to capitalize on it. Yeah. Versus like posture issues and things like that. Versus the shoving the sleeve, yeah. grabbing the collar, pinning the, you know, doing yeah. the knee pivot and one from guard. It was very easy to manipulate people's bodies when I had that. Yeah. But then again, I was like, I don't, I didn't want the argument to be like, you could only do that because you had this on me. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm literally going to take your physical body and bend it at my will. Well, <laughs> like, it's just, headlock stuff's been a huge help. Like, no, that's a huge thing. Know? But, but that's knowing the mechanics of the human body now. That's what I wanted. I was like, you see like the Don Hurd death squad and all these guys that were really focused on finishing people. They had very precise ways of how they you know, broke someone's body down to now they don't have any options and you do. And that's something that was not as needed in the gi mm. because you literally have like Donner talks while you have two ropes around someone's neck, like sleeves everywhere. Like you could just move people. You didn't need to like, you literally were holding people by invisible forces to restrain their body, even though without it, that wouldn't be a thing. The grabbing the, even their belt. Yeah, the belt. Like the you're belt just holding people grip. away. Like you can't escape now. Now yeah. I'm just holding on to you. Their hips. Or literally just taking like a lapel guard and wrapping lapels around people. And it's like you turn some one big knot. Yeah. And it's like, it's just because leverage of the ropes. And it's like, it's still a very funny, interesting sport. But yeah. I kind of still didn't want this ego where it's like, you only did that because you're using the jacket. I'm like, yeah. no, I want to beat you with my body and your body consistently over and over again. I kind of miss the, uh, like the judo from the standing position. Too. Oh, for sure. With the jacket. It's a lot of fun. I mean, you couldn't back out. Suddenly you had this, but it just shifted in its way. And I think a lot of people feel more lost without the gi. So I think that now at this point, in my martial arts training, um, now I'm like no gi grappling has has been my final not my final illusion because i'm still only 34 but like has felt very authentic to me and very satisfying yeah as far as a, a martial artist is, is concerned again the constant learning of spells it's it's like it uh, just it's a catching up. it's never ending for me and i love it so much and again you have a good group of people that you can cast spells with and it's just like and, and excitement too it's like it's not like it's um let's go back to my school's name theory it almost is like we have one big lab here Mm -hmm. And we're constantly coming and go, guys, look what I found. Like, look at what makes this much easier now. And going, oh my gosh, cool. Let's incorporate that into our process now. Yeah. Like, it's a constant exploration of like, look what I found that's cool that will just further like enhance the or even power of this machine. The opposite. Sometimes we go, I saw something. Yeah. I think it's BS. Yeah. But I got to try it because if it works. It's oh, 100%. Awesome. I mean, at yeah. least once or twice a week, I'll, I'll do stuff like that where it's like, eh, maybe. But again, if it works, it yields great potential yeah you know but it's for me it's just this fun game of like constantly enhancing spells so all right think of one it. last question for you. For it. this is the last one <laughs> and then we'll be at time here what's your grappling spirit animal oh my gosh <laughs> a grappling spirit animal yeah uh and this could be a spirit animal of what represents your grappling thus oh, far sure. or it could be one that you want to personify sure uh 
Uh, I think I've always liked the animals that like didn't feel like you had to kill something right away. Oh yeah, I wanted to be like, like spider or something, but something like. So the one that came to mind was like the Komodo dragon. Oh yeah, and the yeah. Komodo dragon was like it bit you, and then you'd run, mm. and it's like you'd run and you'd run, and it's like would well, just take its time, and eventually you're slowly dying from its like venomous kind of weird infection. saliva infection, and basically I like it sounds so brutal, but you're asking, like I want you to beg for death at the end. Mm. Okay, so I I love this idea that if you are fighting me, I never want to be like the Brazilian tap or not, sorry, that's not the one, but like this tap where it's like, it was cranky on the back of my neck or oh, like, it, like I want any excuses. I want you to literally say, stop, please. I beg you. Like, I can't take any more of this. Get the fast tap. Yeah. I don't want a fast tap. I want, I want something where it's like, you are suffering so much. I mean, you think about the smother chokes a little bit. Mm. Um, or even for me to roll you 10 minutes and, to hit something on you consistently if I wanted to, like, or like to have a heel hook and have you look at me and go, I'm screwed. Mm-hmm. Like, just, I'm done. The like, I'm finished. Yeah, that... I don't need to rip this and go, ah, like, I'm, I'm, I can't do it anymore because you broke my foot. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I want full, utter control of you and I'm not afraid to take my time with it. But I'm not like some big marathon roller. I hate when people go, well, give me 30 minutes with you and I'll yeah, beat yeah. you. You're not, I'm not beating you because of your cardio. I'm beating you because I'm per, I'm progressing dilemma wise up your body to where I have the, one of my favorite feelings in jiu jitsu is back control when I have your hand isolated, your leg isolated, and just slip underneath your jaw. That's my favorite because at that point it's like there's so much fear behind what's about to happen next. Of like, do you want to tap right now? It's like to feel like, no, I'm done. Like it hasn't even happened yet, but you're done. Yeah, it's like I have a second from checkmate yeah. here. Versus like, you tapping going, oh yeah, it was just, oh, the back of my neck was just really tough. It's like, I want you to tap without feeling anything. I want you to be like, it's so, so you screwed. you want it really clean? Like, yes, it's well, I guess- so clean. I want it to just be like, I'm done. Like holding an arm lock where it's like, I can't move. Okay, me just going back and you're like, yeah, you got me. Mm. Like I know 100%, like I couldn't fight that. I don't want you to go, yeah, you got me because you went really quick. If you had taken your time with it, I would have just exploded right out of that. Mm, I'm trying to think of any other animals that do things like that. Well, I was trying to think like yeah, some sort of like hunted thing. Like I to. Yeah, so what's funny is that if you think about it, it's supposed to be humans. Oh, the persistent hunters. That yeah, that yeah. would run something so, down in, in theory, right? Yeah, yeah this, at least that's what we've we've heard. heard Neither yeah. of us are anthropologists. Right. <laughs> so, so, but it's, the idea is that uh, something that just was like. Uh, because in jiu-jitsu and grappling it is giving up mm. like the submission is saying i quit you are the better grappler than me and that's what i wanted yeah. i want i don't want it to be like well, you you, you, well i don't know because you could destroy someone's heel of a competition and just rip it and they literally just ah like my arm broke and they're in pain and there was never a, a tap mm. how, okay. many, how many people can you say ego wise that would rather go out that would rather have their arm broke then then submit verbally submit i want you to tap my body like going out just as you holding off the inevitable of just saying like yeah you beat me but i never told you i beat you or you never told me that you were defeated i, I want like, i want it up here like on the ground unconscious well like, there's but there's a victory you. to it but i think to me it's like getting into their soul that i'm the better mm. grappler i want you to like yield yield to me mm. Interesting. You know, interesting. Or I don't know. It's just like, I like the idea of like this kind of inevitable thing where it's no matter what narrative you can say in your mind, like it's almost like if I consistently pass your guard and just peel into mount every single time, like yeah. you know it's inevitable. Yeah. Even if you don't feel it, like I want you to feel in your soul, like almost the time I mount you, you're like mentally like, done. Essentially, you're snake bitten. Yeah. You're just. Sl- Holy. Just over time, I'm sitting here watching you. Like you're already screwed. I already got that underhook. The timer's already set. Mm, so, that's legit. That's the that's the instinct I have right now with that one. But all right, I like, I like it. it. Well, hey, thank you everyone for listening. Um, you know, this is one of our first episodes, so I'm sure we'll end up having more things that we plug eventually and whatnot. We do we, we do we have a website and do we have a social? Media? So we do have a website that we're working on. So it's thegrapplingpodcast.com, and then Instagram, Facebook, and. Well, grappling Instagram is the grapplingpodcast.com and Instagram was like, or sorry, Twitter was a shorthand 
it was like grappling podcast. <laughs> it was really? about how long it was. Like, oh, really? Like, grappling podcast. Like, grappling. Grappling. Gra- Can we do grappling pod? Oh, we could probably do grappling pod. We could That's probably change good. that. First, probably the like, grappling pod. All right. But yeah, so we'll have social media up and get episodes up. Thank you.